Hello and welcome to the Anglican Church of St. John the Baptist Dixie in Mississauga, Ontario. I'm Father Daniel Brereton and it's wonderful to be back here after a couple of weeks off to worship with you on this Sunday. Thank you for joining us. A reminder that you can find an order of service containing the full text of today's liturgy at our website, or you can engage the closed captioning icon and bring the text up on the screen as you're worshiping with us. Uh, although I'm back today, not all of us are back yet. Uh, you'll see that our director of music, Jeff McLeod, is still completing his holidays, but that didn't stop him from contributing to today's service. Uh, from where he's vacationing, he very kindly recorded, uh, along with the help of his uh, partner Aaron, uh, and he recorded the music, sent that in. And you may notice that Sarah Strange, our soloist today, and I will be wearing ear pods during the hymns uh, because we're listening to the music as we're singing the words and James is recording that here in the church. And our hope is to put all of that together into a seamless video. Uh, and my thanks to my long suffering James for figuring out how to do that. Uh, today is August 15th. Uh, it is the feast of St. Mary the Virgin, the mother of our Lord. And uh, in our calendar, she ranks highly enough among the saints that her festival takes precedence on a Sunday. So we will be honoring her today in our worship, uh, as well as our Lord Jesus, as always. And we hope that in reflecting on the work of God in Mary's life, you'll come away with a greater sense of God's work in your own. Thank you for being with us today. O oh, come, let us worship.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Almighty God, to, to you, you all, all hearts are open, open all, all desires known, and, and from, from you no secrets, secrets are hid. Cleanse, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify you. your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. O God, you have taken to yourself the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of your incarnate Son. May we who have been redeemed by his blood share with her the glory of your eternal kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary mortals that you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. The word of the Lord. Psalm 132, verses 6 to 10 and 13 to 14. The ark, we heard of it in Ephrata. We found it in the fields of Jar. Rise up, O Lord, and go to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. For your servant David's sake, do not turn away the face of your anointed one. This is my resting place forever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. The Gospel of Christ. I speak to you in the name of the one who said, those who do the will of my Father in heaven are my brother, my sister, and my mother. Amen. One December Saturday, I was in a Hallmark store buying Christmas cards, 
And if you've ever been in one of those stores, you know they don't just sell cards, but knickknacks, keepsakes, figurines, ornaments, all kinds of things that are easily broken. And into this minefield of breakable objects came a young mother and her little son. Tyler, she said, I'm only going to be a minute. Do not touch anything. Not a minute later, I heard the sound of breaking glass, and I saw the boy standing over a broken ornament, a look of terror on his face. His mother came running up to him. What did you do? And the boy, looking up at her with a tear running down his face, said, I touched something. Hands off. Leave it alone. Do not touch. Messages we all learn early in life, and the message that comes through, the message that we internalize before we're any older than little Tyler, is that touching things, exploring them, making contact, might result in something bad happening. And so, hands off, we learn to tell the world. As we lose our childhood innocence and we begin to build protective walls around ourselves, leave it alone, we tell ourselves, when we're confronted by things that seem too big, too difficult for us to handle. And even God gets told, don't touch. <clears throat> you just stay there, Lord, in the church on Sundays, or between the covers of my Bible, or within our carefully constructed creeds and doctrines. Stay there where we can protect you, Lord. Although I think that what we're really more concerned about is protecting ourselves from God, protecting those parts of our lives that we don't want God to touch. Because we know that God, kind of like a curious child, has also been known to grab things, dragging them down from their places where we've carefully stored them, and sometimes breaking them open. God's touch is not always a welcome thing. But in this morning's gospel, we're confronted by another young mother, or at least a girl about to become a mother, and her message is quite the opposite. Go ahead, Lord. Touch. And in a Me Too world where some of us, at least, are finally becoming sensitive to the reality many women face of unwanted attention and unasked for touching, it's important to note that in Mary's story, she is given a voice. She's given agency. Not only does she give her consent to the angel, let it be done to me according to your word, but she goes on to praise God for not only touching her life, but through her and her child, the world. She does this in a song of praise that many of us know as the Magnificat a word taken from its first line in Latin, magnificat anima meus dominum, my soul magnifies the Lord. Generations of Anglicans know the song of Mary as a canticle sung at evensong. And so many of us have come to see the magnificat as I think we see Mary herself, pretty and placid, gentle and mild. And yet the Magnificat is no gentle hymn, but rather a fiery manifesto. It declares not only the birth of a, of a baby, but the birth of a whole new world order. And the one proclaiming this is no maiden meek and mild, but a mighty prophet. For God has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. All generations will call me blessed, for the Almighty has done great things for me. These are words we might expect from a, a warrior victorious in battle <clears throat> or a king ascending his throne, but instead they come to us in a way that God always seems to deliver God's message in the most unexpected way to the most unexpected people. A young peasant girl in a conquered land who has no power, no wealth, not even a husband yet to give her status in her society. And yet, while millions throughout the greatest empire the world had ever known 
bowed before the military might of Rome and shouted, Hail Caesar! God's messenger, the angel Gabriel, appears in a tiny village before a teenage girl and whispers, Hail Mary! 2,000 years later, no one is saying, Hail Caesar! I think that's what God makes of our power and our privilege. From the world's point of view, Mary has little of value to offer. No power, no status, nothing with which to influence anyone or anything else. From God's point of view, however, she has the one thing that matters, the only thing that God needs, faith. A faith that believes God would touch even a life like hers, that her God would see even someone like her as worthy of being part of God's plan, as worthy of receiving God's blessing. And if God would bless and use a girl like Mary, is there any reason to think that God requires anything more of us, of you or I, to also do mighty things in us and through us? But this isn't just about Mary. She says, God has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. What fills Mary's heart with joy is that God loves to undertake for the, those who call on his mercy. And he will do that for every generation to come. And she mentions this three times. God has mercy on those who fear him. He has exalted those of low degree. He has filled the hungry with good things. That's one side of God's justice and holiness. The other side is that God actively opposes the arrogant and the haughty. Mary mentions this three times as well. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones. The rich, he has sent them away empty. God has come not just to touch Mary, but to touch the whole world and to be a God that the world can touch, especially the outcast. In, in her son, Mary is saying that God is coming into the world specifically for those who have no one to touch, who have not been able to reach out to any power or authority to help them. The poor, the downtrod, the outcast. As we will soon hear another woman, our soloist Sarah, sing about following the sermon. God help the outcast. Father Gerald Robinson Brown, a British priest who has written extensively on the experience of the marginalized in the church, particularly the black and queer communities, writes, the birth of Jesus is the solidarity of God alongside those whose lives are fragile from the very moment of their birth and who die before they live due to the brutality of people, policies, and governments. In her song of praise, Mary is proclaiming a God who in her son is taking a firm stand in this world alongside those brutalized people and standing against the people, policies, and governments, both secular and religious, that brutalize them. Depending on which side you stand on, Mary's words are either a clarion cry of hope or an ominous warning. The reformer Martin Luther, who uh, instigated the Protestant, Re uh, the Protestant Reformation, held Mary in very high regard. And he famously insisted that scripture and liturgy should always be in the vernacular, the language of the people. But in Luther's lifetime, the Magnificat always remained in Latin. And why? Because Luther himself was supported in his work by many princes and nobles, 
men who were themselves sitting on the thrones that Mary promised would be overturned. And they didn't want the Magnificat sung and prayed in the language of the people that the people could understand, putting ideas into the heads of those who might also want to cast down the mighty. Closer to our own time, throughout the 1970s and 80s, governments in several Latin American countries outrightly banned the recitation of the Magnificat, believing that it could encourage revolution. And it did. Mary's words not only show us with whom God takes a stand, but, it, but they also ask us, the church, where we stand. Do we as Christians continue to uphold the very systems of oppression that Jesus came to overturn? Do we extend our grace to the very ones Mary says her son is coming into the world for? Elizabeth, her cousin, calls Mary blessed among women, and Mary herself sings that all generations will call her blessed. But think about how this blessing plays out in her life. Did Mary feel blessed when she went into labor among sheep and straw? Did she feel blessed when her son seemed to repudiate his own blood family for a larger community of strangers? Did she feel blessed when she watched her son executed, nailed to a cross before her own eyes? I think Mary came to understand that being blessed doesn't just mean being rewarded with all the good things in life, but that you know that the best thing in life, God, is present and working in your life and trusting that the things that God touches you, me, our families, our church, our world, will be changed for the better, even if it means they first have to be dragged down from where we've carefully stored them and bubble wrapped them and broken open. The African-American poet Maya Angelou said, there is no greater agony than having an untold story inside you. There is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. We carry within us the very same blessing with which Mary was blessed with. Mary was told, the Lord is with you. And Jesus told his followers, I, the Lord, will be with you until the end of the ages. Do we respond to this divine presence in our life in the same way Mary did, allowing ourselves to trust God to go, to trust God to go and touch what needs to be touched, to break what needs to be broken, to transform what needs to be transformed, and to share the good news of what God is doing with others. Mary, I think, is our ultimate example of what happens when we let the story inside us out when we bring forth what God has planted within us, giving to the good news of the gospel our own flesh and blood, and then we share that with the world. God is still in the world, still reaching out to touch it, placing himself in our hands as Jesus was laid in the arms of Mary, changing, transforming, and ultimately redeeming this world. And that might seem impossible. But to quote another black woman writer, Octavia Butler, we can, each of us, do the impossible as long as we convince ourselves that it has been done before. And as the angel Gabriel said to reassure the bewildered Mary, with God, nothing will be impossible.
Let us confess our faith as we say. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. As we pray to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we sing with Mary, his mother. Lord, have mercy. Your angel declared to Mary that she was to be the mother of the Savior. Help us to be open to your word and obedient to your will. We sing with Mary. Lord, have mercy. Mary rejoiced with Elizabeth and sang your praise. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. Help us to live joyful lives that sing your praise. We sing with Mary. Lord, have mercy. Mary bore a son of David's line, a king whose reign would never end. Bless all the nations of the world with Christ's gift of peace and bless those who are suffering. Let us name them now aloud or in silence. We also remember those who are commemorated in our flowers today, Mary and Charles Lee Ting. We sing with Mary. Lord have mercy. Mary followed Jesus as a disciple pointing others to him and directing them to do whatever he tells you. Help us to be a community that introduces people to Jesus in our words and actions. We sing with Mary. Lord, have mercy. Let us join our prayers to those of Mary and all the company of heaven. As our Savior taught us, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. With the Blessed Virgin Mary, our Lord's Mother, we offer all that we are and all that we have, trusting God to bring from it something holy and of benefit to the world. Let us sing.
peace of the Lord be always with you. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. God, who gave to us his incarnate Son, through the Blessed Virgin Mary, fill your souls with grace, that you too, with Mary and all the church on earth and in heaven, may forever sing of God's goodness and mercy, and the blessing of God, eternal love, incarnate word, and abiding spirit be with you always. Amen. Amen.